Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the College of Business and Graduate School of Management here at Lewis University, I want to welcome you to our campus, albeit here in person and for those joining us virtually. Today marks a special day in the College of Business as we present the first lecture of what will be many to follow in the Reverend Kevin J. Spies Endowed Lecture for Business Ethics at Lewis University. We are fortunate to have Father Spies join us today for which the lecture series is named after. This lecture series exists because of generous friends of the College of Business who believed in the values of ethics as a core element of any great business leader. Because of their generosity, this endowed lecture series gives us the ability to share transform transformative experiences from globally recognized business leaders who exemplify ethical leadership traits throughout their professional careers with our College of Business students, faculty, and alumni. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, let me share a few housekeeping details. First, as our speaker shares her insights, I encourage you to mentally jot down questions you might have and would like to ask of her during our Q&A session. Once the lecture portion is complete, Andy Langert will join Carol Laven Burnick here on the stage to manage the Q&As from the audience for about 10 to 15 minutes. Any questions that you have, we would ask that you raise your hand and someone will come to you with a microphone. Today we are here to learn some insights from a successful business leader who reflects a career that demonstrates ethically based decision making and actions in her day to day life. Carol Avon Burnick is currently the CEO of Polish Nickel Capital Management, a privately held company that manages diversified investments and owns all or a substantial stake in diverse companies ranging from retail sales to thoroughbred racing. During Ms. Burnick's 37 career with Alberto Culver Company, a global manufacturer of beauty and personal care products, she directed the company's new product development, led its consumer products businesses, and was elected executive chairman in 2004. While dramatically growing the company, Burnick instituted the nationally recognized cultural overhaul profiled in the June 2001 Harvard Business Review and in numerous other books and articles. Ms. Burnick's charitable works includes the founding of a support group for Princess Women's Hospital, which has raised tens of millions of dollars to benefit infant and women's health. She and her family also created Enchanted Backpack, a nonprofit dedicated to the support of under-resourced Chicago area schools and child-focused community organizations. It serves over 20,000 pre-K through eighth grade students and 1,200 teachers annually across the Chicagoland area. Without further delay, please give a warm welcome to Carol Laven Burnick. So if I knew you'd take the back rows, I would have put $50 bills in the front for anybody who comes forward. <laughs> anyway, it's like, okay, uh, nobody's getting married today. I'll let you stay back there. Um, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to be back at Lewis. Um, it's a pretty wonderful place. It's honored my family in the past and uh, Brother James, a few other people that I hold very, very dear to my heart. Um, so I wrote a crazy book, and there's one for each of you and anybody you may want to take. Um, to bring one home to. I call it my give back. It's not a biography in any way, and my life sure doesn't warrant that, but it's about lessons learned. And it started with my parents in my formative years. I like to say that I got my business education when I was about 10 years old at the dinner table. Um, my family life and Alberto Culver were intertwined for many, many, many years, and I could spend hours talking about my parents' incredible success their ingenuity, their grit. They took a $400,000 investment at the startup of Alberto Culver and six years later had a $25 million business. Um, that was back in the 50s and you can imagine what those numbers would look like today. Um, my focus today though, I think will focus more on the last couple of decades because it'll probably be a little bit more in tune with what you want to know. So why did I write a book? I'm not an author, I don't even like writing. Um, I wrote it down because I've had a ton of experiences, a lot of incredibly wonderful ones and a bunch of rough stuff. And there are learnings from each. And I hoped that if I would share those wisdoms, I might be able to help some people. So much of what is in my book, Gather As You Go, is simply common sense. And one of my favorite sayings is, common sense is instinct and enough of it is genius. And the idea is to pass it on. I've been pushed by people who helped me edit the book to share some of the reasons why I have the credibility to write it. 
I really, truly cannot stand people with big egos, and I have a hard time even saying this word, these words, but I'll do so by way of explanation. You heard some of this, but on the wonderful, positive, incredibly lucky side, I was privileged to work for Alberto for over three decades, where I conceived and developed Mrs. Dash, Static Guard, Baker's Joy, and Molly McButter, and helped to grow to great strengths some of our well-known brands, shampoos, conditioners, skincare products that you hopefully will see on the slide uh, behind me. We instituted a cultural overhaul that improved our business growth trajectory. That story was published in the Harvard Business Review, and I went on to become executive chairman of our board. Alberta was a New York Stock Exchange family-controlled company, and my dad was likely the oldest living founder to ever turn over a business to a second generation. Not easy. Let's call that a two-year board-negotiated change in management. He was my best friend. <laughs> we sold Alberto to Unilever in 2011. So I've served on the board of Northwestern Healthcare, one of the top 10 healthcare systems in the nation, and I'm privileged to be the immediate past chair. We tripled the size of that healthcare system in the last five years from one hospital to 10. I am so far the only woman to, shit to serve in that role, but I hope they're gonna fix that problem soon. I served on the board of Tulane University for more than 15 years and have lived through Hurricane Katrina and the rebuilding of that university. I am very privileged to be Tulane's current chair. I started a couple of charities, I started a charity a couple decades ago called the Friends of Prentice, and it's raised tens of millions of dollars for Northwestern's Women's Hospital. And more recently, my family founded two charities, one called Enchanted Backpack and another called CeCe's Wishlist, and my daughter created a foundation called Cast Water Safety Foundation, which teaches infants six months to six years to survive a float. If you don't know, uh, drowning is the number one accidental cause of death for children under six. I'm most proud to be recognized as Working Mom of the Year by Moms and Business Network and will tell anyone without question that my three kids have always come first in my life. I manage our family's assets and charitable foundations and serve on multiple boards. But I had high-risk pregnancies and my oldest son was born seven weeks early at four pounds. I lost a baby at seven and a half months gestation and I spent the next six months in bed with my last two pregnancies. Both of those babies were born healthy. That's why I created the Friends Apprentice. My oldest son, Craig, was a darling athletic child who was on the tennis team and the soccer team, but he was diagnosed with kyphosis in his freshman year and had to wear a god-awful Milwaukee brace. It was a really tough uh, four years of high school. I've lived through an awful, very public divorce. My gorgeous older brother uh, was an addict for 20 years. He died of a drug overdose at 42. I met the love of my life, Bobby, a few months after I got divorced. We were incredibly happy for eight years. He died of brain cancer a couple of years ago. I have three wonderful, accomplished, normal children, and despite being three plus years apart, they all decided to get married was inside of nine months, and I planned all of those weddings. That was harder than opening a new factory or launching a national brand. Still pissed off at those kids. <laughs> I am incredibly lucky to now have eight precious grandchildren between the ages of two and eight. I'm sure the words lifelong learning, I'm sure you've heard the words lifelong learning, and for me that is so incredibly true. Someone helps me to learn something new almost every day. And sometimes it's the light stuff about parties or trips, but most of the time it's about business as that is most of what I do. Other times it's unfortunately about something so hurtful to my heart that I don't wanna learn anything more. But most of the time the learnings are good and so I pass them on. In my mind, Gather As You Go is truly a wacky sort of book as it covers a large range of things that interest me from business and leadership, philanthropy, family, raising kids, working moms. I will touch today mostly on some lessons learned in business, philanthropy, and what I call just good advice. My goal with every speech I give, and I give a lot of them, is that you'll take just one thing today. You'll take one thing home with you today that will make your lives a little better, a little healthier, a little happier, and I hope I can do that. So, 
One of the questions I most often asked is, what does it take to succeed in business? After hearing some variations of these questions, several dozen times I put together a list that I use in things like today for speeches or in interviewing candidates or at new employee orientations. Number one, attitude is key. The person who's committed passionately to the success of our business, who has an I can do it attitude, will succeed. One person can make a tremendous difference in a business and it's up to you to demonstrate that you're one of those people. Fight for your ideas and do something big, like really big. The best ideas disappear without a strong advocate and being an advocate for change involves taking risks. Don't be afraid to be visible. In short, take the lead in making a difference. Nice guys do not finish last. They win. Aggressive and passionate should not equate with unpleasant ever. The higher you want to rise, the more pleasant and understanding you need to be. Never underestimate the value of thanks and the value of recognition. Build consensus and direct groups the way you want them to go through reason and courtesy and team building. Ego has absolutely no place in business, and if you have one, I suggest you lose it. Probably the most important words ever. Credibility is everything. Some of the most important career-saving words I've ever heard are, I don't know, never ever fake it. If you're wrong, admit it and correct it. If you've made a mistake, fix it and learn from it. If it's going to take some time to find an answer, simply set a timetable and stick to it. If you never, ever fail, you're never going to grow. And if it's always comfortable and easy, you can't know the big win, the heady feeling that comes from that incredible challenge overcome. You'll learn best when you're taking big risks and you're being stretched. Don't sit back, get involved, and take a risk. The smartest folks I know are very comfortable asking for help. The smartest executives I know seek out and succeed in hiring people that are truly smarter than they are. I hired Andy 28 years ago, one of the best things I ever did, way smarter than me. Asking for help and hiring smart are signs of real strength. Never point your finger unless you're giving directions. A person who always lays blame is soon cut out of team activities, and when you're furious with others, I suggest you take a look inside and see if you're really dissatisfied with yourself. If you don't love what you're doing, you probably won't be successful. And if you are successful, what's the point? You're going to be miserable. I can't figure out when complaining ever got me anywhere. And people, especially in business, they don't want to hear it. So it's best to just keep quiet and figure out how you can fix whatever it is that's upsetting you. And if you can't change it, try changing the way you think about it. Be sure you're with a company that matches your values and aspirations. You're not looking for a place to work. You are truly looking for a home. And finally, give back. Our companies are not perfect. All of you are going to tell me I don't have time. They're the responsibility of business and government and each and every one of us. I'm sure you've heard it before, but if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. And if you don't commit to making a difference somewhere, who will? Okay, a few stories on leadership. I hope these help. Um, this one's called Accentuate the Positive. It's hard to believe, but it takes seven positive statements to counter one negative. I heard that early in my career. I didn't believe it then, but I sure do believe it now. When you're looking for behavior change, you need to tell people the many good things that they do well. You want them to hear the opportunities for improvement, but you need them to be in a positive mode to be able to hear those. Make sure you are noisy about all they do well. Think about it. Few of us ever walk around saying, gosh, you did that so well. We all focus on what needs to be fixed. To get people to really listen, lay out the positives to pave way for the action on the key item that needs improvement. And consider ways uh, of sharing how they can improve. This one's called Executive on Stage. And it doesn't sound important, but it was it's vitally important. Um, I went to a seminar once at a, with a top professor from the University of Chicago. And I'm sure I've corrupted his message, but I took one huge piece of advice. In essence, the concept was stop and think about what you need to be and what impression you want to give in a meeting, a conversation, or any other encounter. Around the same time, we were in a particularly critical situation with our company, and I was executive chair of the board. We had a board meeting coming up, and I had just heard this lecture. 
And I thought about it, and I decided that I needed to be the voice of reason, which is not what I normally am. <laughs> I normally give my thoughts and input any time I think it's appropriate, but I didn't. Uh, there were conflicting opinions and outside experts, and I held my comments for much of the meeting and then helped us solve the critical issue by listening to everybody else and keeping my essential role in mind during the entire two-hour meeting. Now when I'm asked for advice from my kids, when I'm running a meeting or when I'm interviewing folks or leading a group of volunteers, first I think about, well, what do I want them to take away from this session and what do I need to act and feel like? I mean, with you guys, what I've done is I've tried to give you some of my personal life so I can connect with you on some of my business advice. So I'd like to be somebody who can be a teacher today. Whether it works or not, that's up to you. In other words, stop talking without really thinking and focus on your role, your key message, and what you want to accomplish. It's amazing how many times this approach has helped me. As corporate social responsibility becomes more and more essential part of a company's success, there are important things to keep in mind. People want to feel a part of doing something good, and that is even more apparent for younger generations. There's so much bad stuff around, from cancer to the environment to political climate, violence, poverty, poor school systems, the racial issues, just to name a few. When people have a chance to feel like they are making a positive difference, they feel better, but it has to be real. In my book, I took a lot of time talking about the culture change at Alberto Culver. <laughs> the culture change was really hard, and in some ways extremely complex, as it changed so much of what we did as a company. How we interacted with our employees, we needed more sales growth and profit growth. If not, our board was gonna sell the consumer products piece of our business. I didn't want that, my dad didn't want that, but we had real, real troubles. One part of connecting with our people was tying company growth with benefits to the people and benefits to the community. So I'd sit in a board meeting at Northwestern Hospital for a lot of time. They save, they save lives, we make shampoo. You know, a little difficult to connect at. Um, we coined a saying that was powerful growth yields the privilege to care. Increasing profits was vital to our company's success. And we then started to tie every single dollar we made to the ability to increase our employee benefits, to helping over 30 charities in our communities. At our company meetings um, that we held twice a year, we would tell people, our employees of our success with our key customers, and we would tell them where we screwed up so they could help us fix all the business issues. And we showed them heartwarming video clips of our volunteer days in the schools we adopted and where our dollars helped the Boys and Girls Club, Maryville Academy, Off the Street Club, the Rehab Institute, and so many places where we gave dollars and time and made the world a little bit better. Our stock soared, so our shareholders were happy. And as our profits rose, every dollar was tied to powerful growth yields the privilege to care and with it, our morale went way up. Okay, a couple tips for interviewing. I assume some of you are gonna want a job when you get out of here. Be aware, in some companies, the interview starts the second you walk in the door. How will you treat the assistant who picked you up from the lobby? It's often he or she who's the first one on your interview list and you just don't know it. Culture is a pow powerful thing in many organizations and the key will be to see if you fit the company's culture. Here are a couple of good questions you might want to be prepared to answer. So one that I always used, so why are you here and what is your story? <laughs> this is so open-ended that it flusters a lot of candidates. That's also interesting to know. But beyond that, it allows you to know if a candidate knows enough about your company. If you go to an interview, you have to research everything you can possibly find about that company. If I had people in my office who didn't know some of the basics on our website, I tell my secretary to cut the day short and to eliminate the last four interviews. They didn't know it, they just thought it was a short first interview. But if you can't take the time to find out everything you can about the place you may wanna work, I don't want you in my organization. But it's really an interesting question because it gives the, you the opportunity to portray yourself and to give people an understanding of how you would act in a presentation, how excited you can be, what the company's values are, all of that really important. So I always ask a question, now, I'm hiring usually at the executive level, but um, big learnings here. I ask, is there anything at which you failed or wish you had done differently? The people I want on my team have failed a lot 
and they have learned a great deal from their mistakes. If you've not made mistakes, you likely haven't grown as much as others, and I need people who are willing to take risks and grow from the results, whether they turn, whether they turn out positively or negatively. If you've done things you regret but won't share them, perhaps you don't have the openness or honesty many companies want to see in their candidates. Some of our very best hires at Alberto Culver had whoppers to tell me. They were confident and their experiences spoke loudly. I'll never forget the gentleman who was interviewing for vice president of uh, marketing and toiletries and he said, you mean the time I sent filled cans with easy off oven cleaner and sent them to the marketplace. Um, the Pam and Easy Off were both owned by the same comfort company, Boyle Midway, and they filled the oven cleaner in the food product. Uh, I said, you probably could work here. <laughs> Not a good thing. The critical importance of why. So organizations always tell people what to do, and a lot of times they tell them how to do it. But many organizations absolutely fail when they come to explaining the why sharing the in-depth reasons why a given task in a given way is so important. So an example, um, at the factory level, for many companies, including Alberto Culver, Walmart is a huge customer. They have very specific requirements about how goods are to be shipped and how they're to be received. We need to get those cases out the door on time, packed and shipped to their specification. People know in my factory that Walmart's important, but telling our factory workers why they need to do the fill rates exactly as we say is crucial. Tying our success at Walmart to their jobs and to the number of people we hire and to the overall success of the company is key. People want to be part of the winning business. They want to contribute to win and they want to understand the key to winning. We even go so far as to use an example like this. Your daughter's going to the prom. She ordered red shoes to match her dress from a major retailer. That retailer misships, and you get ugly green shoes instead. Your daughter's in tears, the prom is tomorrow, and you want to stop doing business with that number one retailer. On-time delivery maintains trust in a relationship and further leads to better business. A botched delivery breaks the trust and can break the business relationship. Back to Alberto, if we misshipped Walmart a few too many times and they discontinued our brands, there's those $60 million worth of sales and there could go a whole bunch of jobs. So tell employees why what they're doing is important and why doing it in a certain way makes sense. I often speak about transparency in business and I'm asked where do I draw the line between keeping people informed and withholding information. So it is permissible and it is correct to withhold information sometime. Certain aspects of business must be kept confidential. If we're trying to acquire a new company, I can't tell the world protecting my employees' uh, personal information in HR. Can't talk about that. And if new product was being launched, it's really on a need-to-know basis. We couldn't have our competitors learning about that or copying an idea. And there are others, of course. So what I'm trying to say is that when business has issues, everybody knows it. If a university is in trouble, everyone is talking about it. If there's a big malpractice suit in the newspaper, the hospital employees are gossiping about it. My philosophy is business is problems. When you can openly and honestly share the issues with your workforce, they stop making things up. The gossiping will be minimized or stop, and people will be more secure in their jobs and better able to help. All too often, leaders use inside knowledge as their power base, and in my opinion, that's just lousy business. So create, a, create an active listeners. When, you're, when there's a failure of communication in a conversation or with a group, is it your fault or the fault of the listeners? I can't begin to tell you how many times I've worked through an assignment with a group of people or with an individual and I think I've made my points only to later realize that they got about half of what I was talking about. Here's a simple process that works for me, even if it makes some people a bit uncomfortable. At the end of whatever I sat there explaining for 20 minutes, I said, I would ask people, can you sum up what I just told you? <laughs> Most of the time, You'll find you have to clarify at least part of what you meant. Do some people think you're wasting their time? Of course they do. Uh, but you'll waste a lot less time getting clarity, right? So you just say, hey, can somebody sum up what I, what I said? And it gives me the ability to course correct before they walk out of the room and screw up half the assignment. My teammates, my kids, my housekeepers, even volunteers who work, me on a, work with me on a charity event 
are all used to this approach now, and in the process, they've become better at active listening. In-your-face honesty. My parents were absolutely fantastic business people, and all our success started with them and the incredible accomplishments of their generation. But in their generation, you did not share problems. You only shared victories, or that's the way it was at Alberta. We had a huge number of significant changes that took place in our culture movement, and one of them was sharing all the issues, all the problems, all the mistakes, and other vital information with our people. We called it in-your-face honesty. It sounds tough, and maybe it was a little, but it really meant we would talk about the business issues, not the people. We would talk openly about the mistakes we made. We would talk about what happened in the open and not behind someone's back. We also used the phrase, no dead dogs on the table. Kind of crass, but it translates to when something smells and people aren't acknowledging it, you still have real trouble, also known as elephants in the room. We have found that if you acknowledge the fact that business comes complete with endless problems that we are all here to help solve, the walls can come down and people can work as a team. Honesty works, and with it, the organization can basically accomplish just about anything. When you make a mistake, admit it fast, apologize, and make sure the critical people know about it. Everyone's going to make mistakes, and some people really screw up. I find that if you admit it and apologize, it disarms people and takes the heat out of the argument. The best and probably the only thing to do is admit your mistake and a simple I'm sorry doesn't do it and come up with a plan that tells people how and when you're going to fix it. The thing that drives me absolutely crazy is when I know someone messed up and they won't take accountability for the mistake. Then I want to keep working the issue with them until they get it. And the harder the dig they dig in, the more I want them to admit something went really wrong. Okay, that is probably my issue. But I stand by the advice to apologize. If someone says, I really screwed up really badly, but I'm working on how to fix it, I find I have a greater tolerance and even try to help them. The worst thing in business is to find out later that someone gave you wrong information and never came back and corrected themselves or screwed something up and never told anyone. Losing trust is the absolute number one worst thing you can do. So don't wait, act. We had an awful situation in, with our Alberto business in Mexico. We produced aerosol cans and we sent out-of-date packages to a vendor who was certified to accept and destroy those aerosols. Not our plant, but the vendor's plant. It exploded and three people were killed. It was awful and we couldn't have felt much worse. The blame for something like that, even though it was not our plant, often reverts to the originator of the goods. Alberto had product as his vendor, as did many other very big beauty care companies. The Mexican government might never have come back to us for liability, but they could have. We wanted to be very proactive and do what we could for the families who lost loved ones and protect Alberto Culver. We moved very quickly. It's difficult to accept, but our legal system has established a dollar value for lives lost in workplace tragedies based on the victim's future earning income potential and other factors. We determined through our legal folks what that value was and we approached the families and offered three times that value. They accepted it. We also went to the governing council of the town and offered to build a playground to benefit the citizens of the area in which the plant was located. They also accepted this offer and were grateful. None of this determined whether the Mexican authorities would come after our company for damages, but it made us all feel better. In fact, they never did approach us, and we'll never know if our actions helped or not, but the consequences to our company could have been very significant. And in the end, we were truly grateful we could make somewhat of a difference for those families. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> Alberto Culver had decided to separate our two businesses, the Sally Beauty Company, 3,000 uh, beauty stores, the largest in the world, and our consumer products businesses. The business models were in conflict. Sally's largest customers were Alberto's biggest competitors. So L'Oreal was my competitor and consumer and a huge customer of Sally as Procter and Henkel and all the other beauty brands. We made a deal to sell Sally to the Regis Corporation, a large operator of beauty salons under names like Supercuts and Regis. The deal was announced. But a couple of months before the deal was done, um, we heard some things by the chairman of the company talking to the street that, frankly, we knew were false. 
We knew he was, frankly, lying to the street. I'm not allowed to tell you that. Alberto pulled out. We had a major breakup fee to pay, but my board and I were positive it was the right thing to do. For Alberto Culver to pay a company $50 million to get out of that deal, <laughs> we don't spend $50 million on anything. We were in a very tough predicament. We needed to find another partner, and we needed to do it fast. The market had reacted negatively to the um, Regis deal. The Sally people were up in arms. Our customer were up in arms. Merrill Lynch brought a private equity investment firm of Clayton Dubelier and Rice CDR to our attention. They were interested in talking. But Goldman Sachs had been our banker on the deal. So when a deal goes sour, Goldman gets money for the next two years if you go forward with the deal. So here I am going to New York with Goldman and Merrill, big competitors of each other, and we all met in the offices of CDR. The meeting was going really well, and the next step would have been to have CDR go into Sally to do more due diligence. But before I could let that happen, I had something very important to share. I told the CDR folks there was a very strong possibility that one of our biggest suppliers at Sally, L'Oreal, was going to pull their product from our Sally stores. It was also likely they would drop us as a major distributor to, to salons. Losing this supplier would have a huge impact. They were 20% of our business. And given the fact that it was not yet, for certain, some parties to the discussion, you can imagine which bankers, were very upset that I had shared this information with CDR. As executive chair of Alberto, there was no way I was letting more disruption happen at Sally, and no way I could let CDR into our offices to meet with our people if they were not aware of that possibility and willing to go forward despite this risk. The CEO of CDR asked me to join him in his office, and we talked privately. He goes, why didn't you tell me about this before? And I said, honestly, this is our first official meeting. I'm telling you now. It was a huge issue and one that caught them by surprise. We left New York with CDR's promise that we would hear from them later. They had some thinking to do. As it turned out, we did move forward. We completed a reverse Morris Trust deal with CDR. Sally Beauty would become a standalone public company, as would our consumer products business under the Alberto name. CDR, CDR had many friends in France. They were sure they could keep the major supplier we'd spoken of. Wasn't to be the case. The company pulled their business a couple of months after our deal deal had closed. The Sally deal was $25 to the shareholder, a $7 stock. And then you got, I think, a $25 stock for your Alberto uh, price. Well, my family, being the uh, holders of a huge percentage of the Sally shares, had to hold their stock for seven, for, uh, yeah, seven years. Stock dropped from seven to two after the uh, L'Oreal um, pulling. Can you imagine the repercussions if CDR had not known of this issue? Can you imagine the lawsuits that would have ensued? As the years went by, the Sally business actually got stronger, and despite the loss of this major piece of business, Sally did thrive, its stock price seeing 30. Um, I heard an awful story on the radio one morning about a mentally challenged child being beaten by the foster parents because he wouldn't stop asking for another hot dog. He was hungry. The story came to a news station via a neighbor whose own child monitor system had picked up and recorded this situation from an apartment in the same building. The police were called, and this awful story made all the news stations in Chicago. I found out later that morning that the accused parents worked for us at Alberto. I was shell-shocked. Not only did they work for us, but they were longtime employees who'd been on several of our very important committees. That morning, they were both in jail but they would be out on bail shortly. My head of HR told me I had to allow them to come back to work. They were innocent until proven guilty. There was no way I was letting those people back into our building. We prided ourselves on family values and helping people less fortunate than ourselves. The tape recording was really clear and the horrific situation had been broadcast all over the news. I insisted the employees be put on paid leave. I was told our union would put forth a grievance and that if the tape recording from the child monitoring system was not admitted in evidence, the couple might get off and we would owe them lots of money for our refusal to allow them to return to work. Well, this went on for many months and I held my ground. I was visited by the head of HR many, many times in our legal department telling me I may owe these people millions. It turned out the tape recording was admitted to the, in the trial and both employees were convicted and were going to spend some time in serious, serious time in jail. I guess in some ways that was lucky for me because of the stand I had taken. 
but frankly, nothing else made sense to me. When you talk about the culture of a company, I believe it's really important to say what you mean and stand it by what you say. So once again, do the right thing. I want to give you plenty of time for questions. Um, let's see what I'll do here. And the politician said no. So we started over introducing Enchanted Backpack. We've always been huge supporters of education, and we wanted to put my dad's name on a charter school in Chicago to fund its opening. We wanted to have a hands-on connection to helping hundreds of in-need kids in the city of Chicago. We are really excited to do this. Frankly, it was a $5 million commitment. We worked hard with the Noble Charter system, but despite all our efforts, um, politicians got in the way. Three different schools, three different aldermen, three different turndowns, and they were all in areas of the city where the high schools were crazy overcrowded. So after picking ourselves up off the floor, um, we started another charity called Enchanted Backpack. We touched the hearts and minds of over 20,000 students with critical need and 1,200 teachers every single year. We work with educators and administrators to identify the core needs. Now these magical, mystical backpack vans deliver the top 25 requested school supplies for every student in school, plus we send 1,500 uh, core books for free. We deliver art, music, physical education tools, and we donate winter coats and clothing, shoes, socks, and personal care items. Teachers spend serious money from their own pockets to help equip their classrooms and students, and the dollars that are needed are rising. As a society, we don't pay our teachers enough, um, and the first thing a new teacher does is equip a classroom. All teachers need, um, all teachers help kids in need. As a person from the corporate world, what I love about this opportunity to sponsor an Enchanted Backpack Van is that 100% of the corporation's donation goes directly to the schools. My family's foundation covers all administrative costs um, for this program. But the key lessons, don't let the negatives overpower your plans. Figure out how to get around or through the roadblocks or start over again from scratch. The final concept may even be more fun. Ask for help and consult with the experts. We asked for help from educators and likely adjusted over 50% of our original thinking. And we think we're pretty smart. So you gotta go to the people who know more than you do and you gotta ask for help. It's fun to build something from scratch. Just begin. So let's see, I got more stories than I can fill with the time. It took me years and years to learn this, but it's so unbelievably true. It's incredibly difficult to change other people. It's much easier to change yourself. How many times have you tried to get someone to understand your position, to try to get them to see what you've been telling them for years? If they would just try it your way once, they would see how much better their life would you be. I promise you, the vast majority of people are not going to change. Changing yourself is much easier than changing someone else. I have examples of this truth throughout my life, from my marriage to friendship to relationships. Suffice it to say, no matter how right you may feel you are, or how many people agree with you, Change is an enormous challenge, and you can't change other people, you can only change yourself. An easy example to understand is when the person you're trying to change is addicted to drug or alcohol, or has a misconception of the way he is perceived by other people. My brother, I told you, had a drug problem for years, but there were many times when he was just fine, usually after a stint in a very fine rehabilitation center. We would invariably get to talking, and he would swear our family was not supportive. He was adamant that he, we had prevented his success so many times blocked him from investing in a restaurant or a movie or any of his other projects. He would cite the same four examples all the time, but he conveniently forgot the dozens of times when one family member or another had put up funds, had gone into business with him. I had examples, paperwork, all kinds of proof, but his mind just wasn't going to allow him to see the truth, probably the result of a protective mechanism. Finally, after we both experienced a lot of years of pain, I learned to stop trying. For my own good and his, I stopped engaging with him around these conversations, and instead we talked kids, vacations, our childhood. I had to walk away when it came to business. I wanted to have a better relationship with him. I wanted him to have a better relationship with my dad, but it was all way beyond my control. I tried to change my brother to make him see for over a decade. I finally changed myself, and it gave me a measure of peace. So why should you be on a charitable board? I know absolutely no one has a time. But for me, I spent working for great not-for-profits 
probably one of the three most important things I ever did in my life and career. One, you meet incredibly strong people on not-for-profit boards. They get to see your work ethic and can be great references for you. You see how outstanding people conduct themselves. People ask me who were my mentors. Of course, my mom and my dad were my mentors. But what, <laughs> what I've just started to tell people is that John Canning, who was the head of Madison Dearborn, had no idea he was a mentor of mine. But I watched him in that Northwestern board for 20 years. Or Bill Osborne, the head of Northern Trust. Or Glenn Tilton, who ran United Airlines. They don't know that I consider them my mentors. But you watch people in a situation, and that's really where you learn. And of course, you help a fantastic cause. Make sure it's one that you're passionate about. Do you care about the environment, education, healthcare, immigration? When you're choosing a not-for-profit board to work with, see how they're rated. Go to GuideStar or Charity Navigator. See who their board members are. Who is their CEO? Are these people you really respect? Find out about the work you might be doing. Don't do scut work. If it's not fun or interesting, why are you going to do it? Start with your church or alumni group. Ask your friends and people you respect. When making a commitment to serve on a board, is there an annual giving commitment? Make sure you ask. Give your heart and soul. No board needs another noisy voice that is not putting time into making a real difference. Do I have any working moms in the room? One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to read it to you and end with this. One of the great satisfactions I get from public speaking is a chance to salute, promote, and encourage working moms. Still today, when you think most of the battles have been won, there continue to be raging debates about leaning in equal pay, promotion tracks, and work-life balance. So much of this obscures the tremendous contributions that moms make, both working moms and those who stay at home. My respect for both groups is unbounded. It's not easy being a mom. I can't think of a more important job or one that can have a bigger impact on tomorrow's world. I've had the privilege of speaking to numerous groups every year, and when it's appropriate and the talk includes women, I often include the following. Being a working mom means you have to miss a lot. We can never be at every concert or game or field trips, but perhaps we leave a greater legacy. A working mom teaches her daughter every day that being feminine is a good thing, but so is strength and independence and self-worth. We raise our sons with the understanding that women are to be treated as equals and that a mom can be a great cook, a great business person, and a respected partner in life and in work. Working moms, in my opinion, make America's workplaces and communities better for all of us. I believe the work environment is a little kinder and a little more values-based as we carry our family values into the workplace. The smart companies realize how these values build a better workplace for tomorrow. Well, they give a powerful boost this, to the sales and profits of industry today. The path we will forge, we hope, makes it easier for our daughters and granddaughters and builds a place where our sons can be better men. Thank you for taking the time to listen. We'll take any questions you might have now. hear me? Um, Andy Langert was on the board of Lewiston University for a million years and was one of the people who got my family associated with Lewis. But oops, whoops, 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 whoops. Okay, Deb, we screwed that one up. Um, he is, I've said in my life there are two people who I could leave, go away for 30 years and come back and everything about my family, my business, my investments would be better and completely with full integrity. He is an amazing human being. He's worked for lots of wonderful companies, including Beatrice and ConAgra Foods and Keebler and Swift Eckridge. But most importantly, in my mind, he's worked for the Alberto Culver Company. It's been my partner in everything we did in turning around those business. For how many years? Yeah, so um, he's my friend, he's my partner, and don't make it too hard on me right now.
is our good handler. Should have done that in advance. Um, well, Carol did a good job of answering all of my emergency questions uh, <laughs> within your presentation, including a couple that I mistakenly said I might ask her uh, uh, a couple of days ago. But uh, more importantly, are there any questions from our audience? And Debbie has a uh, microphone. Good, you got a nice long walk, Debbie. <laughs> Hi, what could colleges of business do to better prepare students for the uh, business world? So I've had the privilege of being on the advisory board for the Kellogg School, and as I told you, I do a lot of work with Tulane. Uh, I think the best thing you can possibly do is get exposure, tons and tons of exposure. So if there are people like me, and you go to 16, 20 of them in a given semester, you're gonna learn a whole bunch, so I would, if I'm running the College of Business, I would get more and more exposure to real people. Um, I sponsor a dinner series at the Kellogg School where I put 12 kids in a room with somebody who's a past alumni. And they spend three hours just kicking around questions and, and issues. I also think that, uh, so exposure, number one exposure. Um, and internships, you know, if you don't have to do internships at this school, I think that's, that's a real shame because uh, I really think it helps you, helps you to understand. Um, and, you know, in the alumni population, you have hundreds of people who would be happy to talk to these kids, and every, you're going to get a different read on what's right and what's good out there. But I think exposure is, is great. So everybody does a good job in the courses. Everybody teaches you the accounting and the legal side and all that other kind of stuff you do. But like I said, mentors are so incredibly important that if you can really, and, and you, you guys have a responsibility. Coming to a situation like this, you should ask questions. You know, you should think about what questions you want to ask. This is, this is on you to make a real difference in, in your life and career. Agree. Yeah, the more people you know, is the better off uh, you are. Any other questions? Yeah. Carol, thank you so much. I'm Bob Bergman. I teach marketing in the College of Business here. This is absolutely wonderful. I'm sitting with my class here in public relations, and you really touched us with a lot of great lessons. You know, you opened your talk uh, talking about if you've got an ego, lose it, which is great. My wife will tell you, ego stands for edging God out. So, you know, now in our popular culture, all our business leaders and the celebrities out there, everyone from Richard Branson to Donald Trump, to you know, um, they're all out there with huge egos. So it's almost as if we want to emulate those egos to be successful ourselves. And I agree with you totally. What are some ways in which we can self-promote without being a jerk? What would your opinion be or, or your guidance to us be? You know, I know, for, first of all, whatever your political is. <laughs> I won't go into what a jerk Donald Trump is, but he's just a jerk. Um, and Richard Branson, I don't know, or whatever else, but I will tell you there are hundreds and hundreds of people running businesses that may not make the news or don't go on Instagram, but they are really good and fantastic people. So when you, you know, I don't think, I don't think promoting yourself is necessarily, you know, egotistical. You know, I hope you didn't think that I was egotistical when I shared with you a whole lot of stuff. I've gotten a whole lot of awards, guys. I put them in my closet, you know. It's nice to have them. I go in my closet, I look at them. My friends laugh about that. But you can be hugely, wonderfully successful. I mean, I speak 15, 20 times a year. You know, it's, you, you, don't, you don't have to have an ego. You know, Andy, you, you answer that. Well, um... I, th I think uh, you demonstrate a lot of your abilities by helping others. Uh, you know, so if you are of help to others, the first thing you're doing is helping others, but you're also uh, making a name for yourself. Um, you know, a question I had for Carol was uh, uh, about leadership. She, she is a, a much different leader than her parents were. I was fortunate enough to know when they were alive, um, and, and uh, you know. Uh, we have both heard um, uh, a 
former military leaders say that uh, uh, the secret, his, his secret to leadership was quite simple, that it was putting others first. And, you know, uh, Carol certainly does that. You know, uh, Carol made me put uh, 20 copies of my book about Brother James in, in, in the back. Brother James, another great leader, uh, you know, did he put others first? Absolutely. <laughs> So I, 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 I think I think you 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 promote by promote yourself by uh, uh, remembering to put others first and to help others. Any other questions from the group or Andrew? Debbie over here. Um, I just have a quick question about um, what you contribute to the success that you have, even though you have experienced setbacks and hardships throughout your career and then uh, some bits of advice for college students who are looking into creating their own business regardless of what the context of that is um, and then also uh, what you would say is the best course of action for how you do promote yourself for college st students. Hopefully you can help me remember all three of those. So I think the first one was, um, I think it was how do you pick yourself up and move forward after all the CRAP that happens in your life. You know, um, we've all got stuff. We've all got stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of it, I have a sister who's been a victim since she was a kid. She never worked a day in her life. She lives on a mountaintop in Colorado, and she was very lucky to have wealthy parents who set up a trust fund for her. But it kills me. She is a victim all the time. I mean, to me, life's pretty good out there. I don't know if you know what a Japanese garden is, but when you go through a Japanese garden, there are rocks and boulders and weaving places. And it, Japanese basically believe that life is about problems and issues. I mean, there's wonder, life is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And it's very, very tough. So I pick myself up by whenever I'm really, really down. I try to do something pretty incredible for somebody else. It just gets me out of my own way. Um, and, you know, I've got three kids and three spouses and eight grandkids. If, you know, I don't want them to grow up as victims. I want them to grow up as, as positive, powerful people who can make a difference. Um, as for starting your own business, uh, it wasn't exactly the same for me, but I had my first boss who made me cry. Um, when I came to Alberta in the very beginning, they were trying to sell... Um, they're trying to sell one of the new product ideas was a fragrance to spray on your bed sheet so you didn't have to wash them so often. Now, as a college boy, maybe you like that concept, but I, I didn't think it was going to sell. So um, a bunch of us started helping the company think of new products because the other thing that happened to me was on day five of my career at Alberto Culver, a quarter of our people were let go. So it was not, not, a, not a good time. But I had this concept called Static Guard, and my boss berated me beyond anything. And I mean, I literally have cried. I've cried three times with bosses before. Andy has never made me cry yet. Um, but I went to O'Hare Airport. It was before the Hare Krishnas, and you, you can't do that now. But I went with a concept board, and I showed it to people, and I got very, very high satisfaction. So I just kept persevering and persevering and persevering. People, the people who create new product ideas, they believe in them. All the people they ask, they don't necessarily believe in them. You have to market them in such a way to get people to understand that 14 savory flavors are going to shake your craving for salt. Not a bottle of spices, not Mrs. Dash, not a bottle of spices. Who cares about another bottle of spices? But the way you market it to somebody because it's in your head, you know, don't, don't give up. I mean, just don't give up. And your third question, I forget. Did you forget too? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so I, I have a set of chairs that have sayings on them, my favorite sayings on them down in my little workplace at our, at our house, and one of them is, out of, out of adversity comes opportunity. And so every time something terrible goes wrong, I say, okay, if, if that saying is true, where is the opportunity? And somehow there, already, there always is one. There is always something that can be done when you're in the middle of adversity that makes you, enables you to come out of it 
you know, better, stronger. So, so I was with Ginny Rometty yesterday. I wasn't with her. I was at a conference for a hundred of us that were there. She is the past chairman and CEO of IBM and is credited with turning that company around. And she said, you know, people ask me now, they said, why should, why should I follow you? These kids say, she said, why should I follow you? She said, I could give them a list of, you know, seven uh, uh, honorary degrees. <laughs> and, but kids today, you have to earn the trust. You have to earn the trust, and that's what a leader does. You know, a, a leader grows by helping other people to grow. And there's a story up there that I didn't tell you. It's called Be a Leader, Not a King or a Queen. And when you take a new kid or person or director or whatever, and you give them a new assignment, most of them will act like a king or a queen. They'll survey their whole kingdom, and everything in their kingdom is theirs. And they want to know everything there is to know about their kingdom, and they want to sit on top of all their worker bees and understand. Absolutely the wrong thing to do. A real leader is not a king or a queen. They open their arms wide. You know, it's this or it's this. They open their arms wide and they let other people shine. And they give other people parts of the puzzle. And if you really do work for a company, please don't ever work for somebody that you don't think is smart. You know, just, I know it's, it's hard to change jobs and everything else, but don't, don't get in a rut. Work for somebody who is smart. They don't have to be your mentor. They don't have to talk to you every night. They don't have to go to dinner with you, but you gotta be able to learn from them. And Ginny was, was, she was amazing. The other thing she said was that they had started at IBM, um, the whole concept of you didn't need to have a college education to do 20% of their jobs. Now that sounds ridiculous because in the day and age when I'm growing up and everybody, of course you need a college education. But the concept is there's a whole lot of people out there in the world who have skills without the college education. And we need to rewrite our job descriptions to figure out which ones really need the college educations and which ones have, apt have aptitude but not access. This is a pretty amazing conversation and speech. but. Um, I don't know, work, work the people you know to help you find a good job, and don't, don't worry about if, some, if you ask somebody to do a favor. Um, and there's a whole lot of fields now. I'm sitting there in the medical field watching the mass need for technicians and nurses and all the rest. So pick a field that you can grow in and uh, continue to learn from too. One last question, are we done? I think that's about it, Brian. Brian, do you have anything? We can take one more if you, you can see it. Oh. Was there another? No. She's giving you a microphone. Okay. Thank you, Carol and Andy. A really great uh, lecture today. Good Q&A from the audience. Um, and just to close, my role here as dean is to ensure that collectively our faculty and staff, the greater university community, adheres to this tradition of excellence ingrained in our LaSallean heritage as we embrace the notion that a Catholic B school's duty extends beyond our classrooms, as we strive to develop ethically grounded business school graduates in the 21st century social conscious leaders within our global society. I believe that today's wise insights and professional experiences you know, shared by you today, Carol, demonstrates that as you advance your career, you will quickly learn that others in our community will look to you to take up the responsibility to take concern in the world around us, to realize our ethically based institutional values, not as abstract ideals, but as core values that we are ingrained within your daily lives similar to how others look to De La Salle. So in closing a special lecture, I want to acknowledge the various Lewis University departments and individuals who worked tirelessly to ensure this morning's program went off successfully. And a thank you also to uh, Dr. Livingston, the president, and Dr. Chris Sent, the provost, for their attendance today at today's lecture series. And then finally, a huge thank you to you, Carol, uh, for so graciously accepting the invitation to be our inaugural speaker for the Reverend Kevin J. Spies Endowed Lecture for Business Ethics. This concludes today's lecture. Thank you for all that joined us uh, here in person and virtually. Good day.